Years ago, my young niece called and announced that she had just had an apostrophe. <laughs> she meant epiphany, but I have loved the idea of having an apostrophe, maybe even an exclamation point, at the very least the occasional semicolon. And so I thought in the interest of our theme of learning today that I would share with you three apostrophes that have absolutely altered how I see the world, how I see myself in the world, and what is required of me. But I thought it would lay the groundwork by reading a brief memo from my second book, Fierce Leadership, a bold alternative to the worst best practices of business today, which could easily have been titled A Complete Guide to the Fricking Obvious, <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> So, but my publishers would not go for that. So I just wanted to share this with you because it will lay a little groundwork. Um, congratulations, you are a leader. It's a heavy load, but someone has to do it. The primary focus of your organization is growth. To help in this regard, it is your duty to lead change, manage and motivate a multi-generational workforce, and execute initiatives that impact the top line and the bottom line simultaneously while delivering short-term results. <laughs> you must demonstrate agility, speed, inclusiveness, strategic acumen, and innovation, manage uncertainty and risk, and mitigate the impacts of globalization, offshoring, a recession, global warming, the price of oil, etc., etc., etc. If you fail, darkness will cover the earth. <laughs> The stock value will plummet and chaos will reign, hence a few suggestions, and there are 10. One, in order to hold off the forces of darkness, you must stay awake and locate your body parts. <laughs> Two, names and ideas will occur to you. The ideas you should write down and act on immediately, or if you don't have the authority, fight for. The names are of people you need to either make available to industry because they are sucking the joy and life out of everyone and everything they touch, or they are the people you should promote and to whom you should give heaping handfuls of freedom and encouragement to break the rules. Three, you will not single-handedly cause or prevent success. Surround yourself with people who model accountability, ferocious integrity, personal authenticity, the capacity to connect with others at a deep level, and, a, and the commitment to champion the common good over narrow self-interest. Four, your central function is to engineer intelligent, spirited conversations that provide the basis for high levels of alignment and collaboration and partnership throughout your organization and the healthier financial outcomes that go with those. Five, people may not wish you well. So pay attention to your emotional wake. You are not invincible. Be kind. Everyone is carrying a heavy load. Six, on the other hand, don't suck up to anyone ever, or you will turn into a lick spittle and your soul will refuse to accompany you into the building. <laughs> Just keep describing reality from your perspective without laying blame, and you'll be fine. Seven, don't even consider recommending a reorganization. <laughs> Anyone who requires more than re one reorganization over the lifetime of his or her career will forfeit a year's income, including bonuses and stock options, and possibly serve jail time. <laughs> Eight, do not under any circumstances tell a lie of either commission or omission. Do not stretch the truth, exaggerate, or make shit up to get out of trouble or to make yourself look good. Not only because that would be bad on many levels, but also because it will come back to bite you in the butt at the worst possible moment when you least expect it with the highest price tag on it and possibly appear on YouTube. Nine, do not attempt to project different images depending on whom you're with. People can spot inauthenticity from 50 paces. Show up as yourself consistently. And 10, 
Bear in mind that while no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a career or a company or a relationship or a life, any single conversation can. So take it one conversation at a time and make them fierce. Which brings me to my first apostrophe that I want to share with you. I had been working with CEOs of the kinds of companies without whose products and services you and I would not enjoy um, our favorite jeans on our favorite sofa, drinking our favorite coffee or glass of wine, playing Angry Birds. We would be naked in the woods, unwashed, breath reeking, trying to rub two sticks together, and other than trying to stay alive, bored out of our frozen brains. And at a point in working with them, when I'd had about 10,000 hours of conversations with them, either one-on-one -on -one or when they were together as a group, I happened to be reading Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? and he's in a bar, everybody's been drinking, and he responds, gradually, and then, suddenly. <laughs> and my apostrophe was, our careers, and our companies, and our relationships, and indeed our very lives, succeed or fail, gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. Certainly, what gets talked about in a company, how it gets talked about, and who gets invited to that conversation determines what's going to happen and what is not going to happen. Second apostrophe, the problem, the reason why so many of those conversations and meetings fall short of what we would all like them to be or some flat out fail is because so many of us suffer from some degree of alethophobia which is an intense, illogical, or abnormal fear of the truth. And while alethophobia may sound like a serious psychiatric disorder, I am convinced that at this exact moment in time, there are millions of people on this planet who are withholding what they really think and feel from someone at home or at work and are paying the price in the fall of 2008, it took nothing less than the failure of Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and AIG and Washington Mutual and the top U.S. automakers and the subsequent devastation on Wall Street for executives and political leaders to acknowledge the seriousness of the situation. And yet, if you're like me, you were wondering at that time, how long had those fires been smoldering? What were they pretending not to know? And how did they literally go bankrupt? And I think they went bankrupt one failed, one missing conversation at a time with one another, with their customers, with the unknown future emerging around them. But let's get personal, because I don't think it's fair to put it all on the leaders. How many times have you told someone, your boss, a colleague, a customer, a family member, what you thought they wanted to hear, rather than what you were really thinking? Or painted a false, rosy picture of reality, glossing over problems, or pretending they didn't exist? sat in a meeting and watched somebody toss out that ceremonial first lie and remained silent or tossed it out yourself. If you're like most people, I think that there are plenty of times, in fact, I thought about calling this talk Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what the world would be like if every time any of us told a lie, even a tiny one, our pants ignited? <laughs> It would either solve the problem overnight or we would need to carry personal fire extinguishers, which we might, because to cut us some slack, it would be easy to argue that our fear of the truth is not illogical, telling it like it is, speaking ground truth versus sort of parroting the party line, which we know to be bogus, is no one's idea of exalting. In fact, it feels so alarming and risky that we are sometimes willing to put a for sale sign on our integrity in order to avoid it. 
After all, we've all witnessed a kind of violence. It could be a lost raise, a lost promotion, a lost seat at the table, visited on those who did speak their hearts and their minds, and it is raw. And yet, and yet, if a problem exists, it exists whether we cop to it or not, right? In fact, Carl Jung said, what we do not make conscious emerges later as fate. Gradually, 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 then suddenly. So I want to bust one of the worst, best practices of business, and the one that I think single-handedly created the global financial meltdown. And I think a meltdown such as we have had is a terrible thing to waste, and yet I'm not convinced that we gotten it yet. I think we may start to repeat the same kind of stupid things that we've been doing for years and years and years. So the practice that I want to bust, and by the way, we're always practicing something. The question is, what are we practicing? The practice I want to bust is called legislated optimism. It's the purview of the one-way leader, where communication is primarily one way, from the leader to everyone else, and the reverse is not valued, it's not welcomed, and the message is often upbeat, don't worry, things are okay, we got it covered, we have a plan. This is often insisted on literally the day before the company declares bankruptcy. In an environment of legislated optimism, conclusions are reached at the point where everyone stops thinking, which is usually short of brilliant. And we stopped thinking because clearly our leaders have done the thinking for us and called it good. And to tell them what we're actually dealing with would probably not be a career enhancing move on our part. And we know the difference between the weak leader who's looking for compliance and agreement and the strong leader, the fierce leader who wants the truth. The alternative to legislated optimism is radical transparency. But there are a couple of beliefs that are squarely in the way. The first commonly held is that most people can't handle the truth. You remember Jack Nicholson, you know? Most people can't handle the truth. It's one of the reasons why there's a, another worst best practice, 360 degree anonymous feedback. Let me ask you something, and I'm really asking, I want you to say something to me. If somebody in your workplace was unhappy with your work, what would you hope they would do? Tell you. If they were happy with your work, what would you hope they would do? Tell you. But no. Feedback is invaluable. We want it. We seek it. We benefit from it. But only if it comes straight from an individual. In fact, it doesn't. Anonymous feedback fails to create the kinds of lasting changes that we want because we might receive five good things about us and one that's not so good and all we can think about is who thinks that about me and why. Think about the definition of the word anonymous, faceless, nameless, no distinguishing features or characteristics. Do you know anybody who would want to be described that way? I mean, in what universe would anonymous feedback, anonymous anything, be considered a best practice? It reminds me of those drug commercials you know, for the latest, coolest, neatest drug, and somebody who's taking whatever the pill is, is, is dancing through the field of daisies. And sotto voce, the announcer is saying, side effects can include internal bleeding. <laughs> you know, loss of libido, um, <laughs> thoughts of suicide, uncontrolled barking, sudden death. <laughs> I think that the warning that should accompany Anonymous feedback should read not to be used by organizations that value honesty, openness, and transparency, or by any individual who sees authenticity as a valuable characteristic. Side effects can include a culture of terminal niceness, avoiding or working around problem employees, tolerating mediocrity, skirting the issues. If you are experiencing rapidly deteriorating relationships, 
and to have difficulty maintaining eye contact with your peers, call your HR director immediately as these symptoms may be serious and could become permanent. I think we're bigger than this. In fact, my experience of most people is quite the opposite of we can't handle the truth. There is something within us that responds to those who level with us, who don't suggest our compromises for us. In fact, those careful conversations that we're so proud of and so fond of are failed conversations because they merely postpone the conversations that want and need to take place. We can handle the truth, hold us able and lay it on us. There's a second belief that's a big problem held by many leaders. It's lonely at the top. Nuh-uh. No. If it's lonely at the top where you are, that's telling us lots more about you than it is about anything else. The answers are in the room. The answers are in the company. Depending on the topic, get the right people in the room and ask us, what's going on from where you sit around this issue? What are you noticing that maybe I'm not noticing? What's reality like for you from where you live in the company around this topic? Do you think there's something we're pretending not to know? Is there any kind of integrity outage here? And if nothing changes, what are the implications? And if you could give me the best possible advice, what would you advise me to do? In a very real sense, and this is the third apostrophe, in a very real sense, I think that the future of the world, the progress of the world, depends on our progress as individuals now. I don't want us to put this all off on the so-called leaders. In fact, leadership is not a title, it's a behavior. And anyone can exhibit it. When people say, I don't, I don't, I can't behave this way, I can't speak my mind because in our culture it would not be welcomed. I wish I lived in a culture of radical transparency. I, I always challenge that because I'm looking at the culture when I'm looking at you. You are the culture. Every single time you and I walk into a room and open our mouths, pick up the phone, send an email, we are reinforcing a healthy culture or a sick one. We're modeling courage or cowardice. We're shaping the culture every time we show up and every time we fail to show up, every time we shrink our subatomic particles and try to disappear off the radar screen. So I want to close with the first stanza of a poem that I love by William Stafford. The poem is called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. If you don't know the kind of person I am and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. I don't believe for a moment that anyone who is here today or is watching this talk or will listen to it in the future wants us to miss our star, and yet we may very well miss our star unless we begin to engage in radical transparency, those wonderfully fierce conversations in which we come out from behind ourselves into our conversations and make them real. Fierce leadership is not for those who want to be shadows in the crowd. It's for those who are willing to tackle our toughest challenges, who are willing to set aside the old corporate way and to execute with a much higher level of integrity, both personally and professionally. And I hope that this is something we will do together. And in the meantime, my hope is that you will sit beside someone you care for and begin. Thank you.